Okay, everyone, welcome. Uh, thank you for coming. Welcome to this first panel discussion as part of Energy Days 2021 entitled Getting to Negative Strategies, Ethics, and Co-Benefits. My name is Erica Smithwick. I am an Associate Director at the Institutes of Energy and the Environment and a professor in the Department of Geography in the College of Earth and Mineral Sciences. This is a special panel for a couple important reasons. First, this panel is part of a series of events uh, that are part of the College of Earth and Mineral Sciences year-long 125th anniversary celebration. Formed in 1896, several decades, it should be noted, after the first oil well was found in Pennsylvania, the mission of the college is now quite broad, including a broad interdisciplinary focus on earth, energy, material sciences, engineering, and geography. And this panel that you'll hear from today exemplifies this current breadth and depth, including current faculty from the college, as well as from the College of Engineering that it so happens is also celebrating its 125th year anniversary. So happy birthday to, to both colleges. Uh, secondly, this panel is important because of the urgency of the issue. On Monday, the International Energy Agency released a report entitled Net Zero by 2050, a roadmap for the global energy sector. As the foreword to this report indicates, there is a need to quickly bridge the gap between, quote, rhetoric and reality, unquote, on emissions and emissions reductions. Laying out milestones as well as identifying just and inclusive transitions was a focus of this report. As you know, President Biden has also announced a new target to reduce emissions by 2030 to approximately 50% of the 2005 levels. And as we head into the next COP meeting, it is globally recognized that such reductions are needed to avoid warming to the 1.5 degrees Celsius level. However, as many of you know who are attending today, such a shift um, to the energy sector will also require a massive societal shift in over just a decade, um, if some estimates are correct. So innovation and scalability of key existing technologies, including advanced batteries, carbon capture and storage, hydrogen, and so on are going to be critical. All the while, we also need to be expanding energy availability and supporting individual and societal decision-making, in particular, including justice and equity as a core issue in those decisions. So luckily, we have a great panel here today that can help us think through these issues. Uh, I am going to introduce our panelists first, and I think you'll be impressed with their, with their backgrounds and qualifications, and then ask each of them to speak uh, for no more than about three minutes on a question that I've prompted them with before today. And that question is, from your professional perspective, what is one key challenge, and importantly, one key opportunity for decarbonization? And then we'll open it up. Uh, I have a few questions as well, but we'll also open it up for questions from the attendees. Uh, you should be instructed to use the Q&A button and to um, ask your questions in the Q&A that I will be moderating uh, with the help of the panelists as we move through um, the session today. We do just have an hour, but we're really hoping for a robust discussion. All right, so first I'm going to introduce the panelists in the order in which they, they will be speaking. Wei Peng is an Assistant Professor of International Affairs and Civil and Environmental Engineering with a joint appointment with the School of International Affairs and the College of Engineering. Peng's research focuses on the environmental and socioeconomic impacts of energy policies in both emerging markets and advanced economies. She was a Georgia Rufalo Postdoctoral Research Fellow at Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government. And she earned her PhD from Princeton and her BS from Peking University. Jennifer Baca is an assistant professor of geography in the College of Earth and Mineral Sciences. Her research focuses on how material, political, and environmental processes interconnect and with what effects in the context of energy development. Before coming to Penn State, she was an assistant professor of geography and environment at the London School of Economics and Political Science and a postdoctoral associate at the Yale School of Environment. She earned a PhD in environmental studies from Yale, a master's of public policy from UC Berkeley, and a bachelor's at George Washington University. Jacqueline O'Connor is an associate professor of mechanical engineering and the director for gas turbine research education and outreach in the College of Engineering. Her research focuses on unsteady combustion phenomena and power and propulsion technologies, such as gas turbines, aircraft engines, and diesel engines. She was a postdoctoral researcher at Sandia National Labs, and she earned her grad degrees uh, from Georgia Tech and MIT. 
Bruce Logan is an Evan Hugh University Professor in Engineering and the Cappy Professor of Environmental Engineering in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Penn State. His research focuses on developing new renewable energy technologies, such as microbial fuel cells and thermal batteries for achieving an energy sustainable water infrastructure, including wastewater treatment and bioremediation. He serves as director of both the Engineering, Energy and Environmental Institute and the Hydrogen Center, Hydrogen Energy Center in the College of Engineering. And he's also an associate director of Penn State's Institute for Energy and the Environment. He has a PhD from UC Berkeley, a master's and BS from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Tom Richard is a professor of agricultural and biological engineering in the Department of Agricultural and Biological Engineering <laughs> and a director of Penn State's Institutes of Energy and the Environment, which is sponsoring Energy Days uh, today. His research focuses on the application of fundamental engineering science to microbial ecosystems, developing innovative strategies for a more sustainable agriculture and the emerging bio-based economy. Among many activities, he is currently serving on the Agricultural Science Committee of the US EPA Science Advisory Board. He received a PhD in Biological Engineering and a Master's in Agricultural Engineering from Cornell and a BS from UC Berkeley. And finally, but not least, Zhao Jing Wang is an Associate Research Professor in the EMS Energy Institute. His research focuses on the catalytic conversion of energy resources, including petroleum, natural gas, and biomass, and the synthesis, characterization, and evaluation of porous functional materials and energy applications. He was recently the recipient, recipient of the Outstanding Young Researcher Award at the 15th International Conference on Carbon Dioxide Utilization. He has a PhD uh, from Xiaoming University in China and a BS in chemistry from Zhejiang Normal University in China. So we have a great set of panelists today and I look forward uh, myself to hearing, hearing them speak for a few minutes and then we will open it up for questions. So Wei, if you're, if you're okay to start, we'll begin with you and I'll repeat the question again, just for the audience, which is from your professional perspective, what is one key challenge and one key opportunity for decarbonization? Thank you, Wei. Thanks, Erika, and great to be here. So let me first summarize what I want to say in just two sentences. I think the key challenge is that to most people, climate change is not their top priority. But efforts to tackle climate change can bring co-benefits to address those things they care most about. And these co-benefits create opportunities for us to accelerate climate action. So now let me expand on that. So we all care about a lot of things, but really the question is, what are the things that keep us awake at night? And how many of us lose, lose sleep because of climate change? And I have to say, I do. And I think many people on this panel and in this webinar do as well, but probably not the majority of society and definitely not everyone. Unfortunately, we do need this sense of urgency and also strong willingness in order to mobilize the technological, social, and political movement so that we can curb our emissions before it is too late. So how can we make climate policy work when people actually care about different things for good reasons, such as their jobs, their health, clean air and water in their home cities, et cetera, et cetera. And this is where health, this is where co-benefits matter. And to be honest, this is also what get me back to sleep when I worry about climate change at night. So there is a wide range of potential co-benefits. For example, Renewable industry creates green jobs. And in this country, clean energy sectors like wind, solar, energy efficiency already employs more people than fossil fuel. In addition, when we reduce using fossil fuel, we not only reduce carbon emissions, we also reduce air pollutant emissions. And as we all breathe cleaner air, fewer people die prematurely because of this exposure to air pollution. I just give you just two quick examples, but I can actually go on and on for a very long list of potential co-benefits. So this all sounds really promising. Let's just embrace the co-benefits and save the planet. But not surprisingly, when we turn this idea into actual policies on the ground, things get complicated. And that is what I do research on. So because of the limited time I have today, I just wanna highlight two issues for us to think about. The first thing is that co-benefits alone won't get us far enough to achieve the scale of transformation we need in order to solve the climate problem. Take China and India as an example. The co-benefits from improving local air quality and health can incentivize them to reduce the dominance of coal in their energy sector. However, it is not enough for them to completely shift away from coal 
which is what we need in order to stabilize the climate system. And the second issue is that the co-benefits are not uniformly distributed across regions or across population groups. And what makes this even trickier is that there are potential losers who can come out of this transition. For example, how about those coal miners in our state? So um, Jen Becker is going to talk more about this in a minute, but I do want to emphasize that um, equity and also the distributional consequences is really at the center, both for climate diplomacy in the international arena and also domestically how we can make it work. So um, just to quickly summarize what I want to say, co-benefits, from my perspective, make climate policy more attractive. But we need to be smart to navigate through our social and political system in order to make it feasible. With that, I'll end here and look forward to more discussions. Great, thank you, Wei. That, that was a, a provocative start and I really appreciate your, your thoughts there. Let's turn it over to Jen, Jen Baca. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me to this panel and Wei, thank you again. Um, that was an excellent kickoff prompt. So, and I think you teed me up nicely here. So I wanted to talk um, a little bit about the ethical dimensions of um, getting to zero or um, I'm gonna actually focus my comments around negative emissions technologies. And just by way of background, you know, I am a geographer in Penn State and I have broad training in political ecology and economics. And I've worked for, um, you know, the last couple of decades looking at renewable energy technology systems like bioenergy and as a native of Pennsylvania and as a, um, you know, somebody whose grandparents were coal miners and um, I've now turned my attention to the energy transition that's going on here in Pennsylvania. And I have the privilege of sitting on the um, Environmental Justice Advisory Board for the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection. So I'm, I feel very privileged that I get to wear you know, both an academic hat and I also see when the rubber meets the road, especially when it comes to trying to put some of these ethical concerns that um, I'll lay out in a few minutes um, into action in the policy sphere. Okay, so getting to the prompt um, for the panel, the key challenge I see in meeting some of these goals that Erica outlined in her introductory remarks, most notably the IEA report from Monday, um, I think that we need to be thinking more centrally about you know, some of the ethical concerns around negative emissions technology, such as carbon capture and sequestration. When I was preparing for the panel, I was looking through this IEA report and I went back to the um, fifth assessment report from the IPCC, and it seems that any these um, negative emissions technologies, the NETs, are going to be part of a solution to get us towards net zero emissions um, in some part our parcel. But surprisingly to me, despite these robust discussions that have been going on about energy and environmental justice, what I'm seeing in the literature is that these NETs have primarily been analyzed in terms of their technological potential and their economic potential, and usually in demonstration scale projects. So we haven't really seen these technologies rolled out at wide scale, and we really haven't done this equity and justice analysis to understand how communities and ecosystems would bear the distributions of costs and benefits from this sort of rollout. So that's the key challenge I wanna um, lay out for the panel today and hopefully a conversation that we can continue through um, these two days of the conference. But there's a lot of opportunities here because um, parts of these NETs aren't new to us who have been studying energy for quite some time. So there's actually a lot to be learned from previous studies of renewable energy rollout. And there's also a lot to be gleaned from these emerging conversations around energy and environmental justice. And what I just want to lay out briefly um, is a little bit of a framework. So when you're looking in this energy and environmental justice scholarship, you usually want to approach these issues you know, with three key aspects in mind. And Wei got to some of these, so I'm glad that you know there's some consensus emerging here on the panel. Um, so first you wanna think about the process, who gets a seat at the table, um, and then by, ex uh, by extension, who isn't seating at, sitting at the table that should be there. Then you wanna be looking at recognition. So it's not just enough to have a seat at the table, but you wanna make sure that everybody feels 
that they have been fairly represented in negotiations. And then you wanna look at the distribution of outcomes to see how the pie is sliced, if you will. So those are the three pillars that you wanna to take to you know, understanding um, this technological rollout and this process of transitioning the energy system um, so that we result in a lower carbon energy system with a more equitable bit distribution of costs and benefits. Okay, and I come at this from, you know, um, extensive work on the bioenergy sector. And in particular, I think that a lot of the discourses and policy challenges that I studied for bioenergy might be primed to, you know, come to the forefront again as we roll out these negative emissions technologies, particularly the bioenergy with car carbon capture and sequestration, which is sometimes referred to as BECS in the literature. Um, so this is one of the lower hanging fruits within the NET suite of options. Uh, and I think that we can nicely mine some of the literature on biofuel so that we could maximize the benefits and minimize some of the costs. So just you know, personal perspective from my own research, one of the key questions about biofuel rollout was where to situate biofuel projects. And there was a lot of discourse um, globally about situating biofuels on quote unquote marginal lands. And so then policymakers would go to, you know, their land classifications that are done by the government, or they would deploy renew, um, remote sensing technology to identify marginal lands, but there weren't many people putting boots on the ground to really understand the significance of those landscapes to um, rural and local communities. So I think that's the type of takeaways that you know, we can bring to this rollout of NETs. So you, know, you want to triangulate your sources. Um, what is the government saying? you know, what kind of um, data can we get from, you know, um, more of a top-down analysis, but then complement it with bottom-up perspectives, where you actually go out and speak to communities and understand, you know, the systems in which these landscapes and livelihoods are situated. And so with that, um, I will turn it over to, I believe, Jackie, who is up next. Yeah, thank you, Jen. That, that's Great, and uh, hopefully a perspective we can come back to throughout the discussion. Jackie, given your you know, sort of interest and engagement with, with uh, the technical side of some of these technologies, perhaps you can speak to this question as well in terms of challenges and opportunities. Absolutely, so thanks again to all for inviting me to speak on this panel. Um, like Erica said, I'm a technology person, and so I'm gonna talk to some of these technologies and their opportunities, but I do wanna mention that it's absolutely critical that technology people like me are in constant conversation with policy and ethics people like Wei and Jen, not just because Wei and Jen are very nice people, but their, their perspectives are extremely important for us that are working in the technology space. Um, so in terms of challenges, I think there are a lot of technologies with high decarbonization potential, things like electrification of personal transport, you know, electric vehicles, electrification of public transport, electrification of homes, businesses, and even some industrial processes. Um, however, there is a segment of technologies that require high energy density in terms of either mass or volume where electrification is either impossible or too far off to, be, to, to meet the goals that we have, um, or it's neither practical nor safe. Um, and so these technologies include things that I work on, air transportation, marine shipping, long haul trucking, military applications, and a number of industrial processes. In addition to these challenges of decarbonization, I think there's uh, most of these, with the exception of air travel, are things that people don't touch in their daily lives, right? It wasn't until the Ever Given ran into the side of the Suez Canal that people really realized how large container ships are. Um, and so I watched that with great interest to see the international you know, community wake up to the fact that we have you know, tons of these ships running around uh, the, the planet every day. Um, and so our messaging around decarbonization sounds inconsistent to the average user, right? We're telling people, you should be driving electric vehicles, but these other class of vehicles, they don't have to electrify, they can still be buying fuel, right? So, so there are some challenges, both on the technology side, but also the technology rollout side um, and the adoption of these technologies at a whole bunch of different levels. 
However, I think there are a lot of really interesting opportunities. And the one that I want to focus on is, as an example is sustainable fuels um, or zero carbon or even negative carbon fuels um, that would allow us to continue to use these really high energy density technologies. For example, recent congressional testimony by Steve Sanka, who's the executive director of an organization called CAFI, the Commercial Aviation Alternative Fuels Initiative, uh, spoke to sustainable aviation fuels or SAF. Um, and they're a growing component of the aviation fuel market. They'll soon take up 1% of the aviation fuel sales. That doesn't feel like a big number, but CAFI only started a little over 10 years ago, and we really only got SAF into the pipeline maybe five or six years ago in any meaningful way. And so the trends are really promising. In 2020, uh, 59 million gallons of SAF were produced by 2025. Estimates are over a billion. Estimates in Europe are even more uh, are even more optimistic. And again, these numbers come from Kathy. Um, currently, conversion processes now for sustainable aviation fuels have over 70% life cycle carbon reduction. There are realistic pathways that are being implemented now to 100% uh, carbon reduction, and even some opportunities for carbon negative fuels. Um, so I think one of the major opportunities is the significant interest in sustainable fuels. If you look at who is investing in the, in the development and scale up of these processes, it's not just companies that make them or airlines or airports who are going to buy them, but there are traditional oil companies, including BP, Phillips 66, and Shell, who are signing on to these things, as well as big corporations. People like Microsoft are actually buying into sustainable aviation fuels. One of the other really good opportunities being at a university, university and national laboratory research is having a direct impact on the deployment of these fuels. By providing fundamental knowledge that's helping to streamline the fuel certification process, which is quite rigorous for aviation, right? You're flying at 40,000 feet, you don't want your airplane to fall out of the sky. Um, an example of this is a recent project called the National Jet Fuels Combustion Program, which was co-funded by the FAA, the DOE, and NASA, um, that really helped to streamline some of these processes and allow more, uh, more small companies to take their novel technologies and scale them up. So we as researchers could have a direct impact on the deployment of net carbon negative fuels, which is a critical step towards deep decarbonization. I'll turn it back to Erica. Thank you, Jackie. That was that was great. Um, Bruce, uh, I think you're up next. And I'm, I'm curious of your thoughts. Maybe I know you've been thinking a lot about some of the trade offs here when it gets down to uh, number crunching in terms of the net benefits of some of these technologies, but also around the social side as well. So maybe you can speak to your thoughts on the challenges and opportunities. Yeah, let me reemphasize a point that um, we really need to decarbonize, but we need to go negative and and I think oftentimes we just end up talking about trying to go zero, but going negative is a much harder thing. Um, fossil fuels are only about two thirds of all greenhouse gases. And so just zeroing fossil fuels is not going to solve uh, climate change. But let me focus just on one aspect of greenhouse gas emissions, and that's those that are associated with our food system. Energy for our food system is about 25% of the energy that we consume in the US. It's about the same in Europe, and it's about 22% of our carbon footprint. Why is our food system so high in, in numbers? It's, it's fertilizer, 1% of CO2 emissions, transportation, refrigeration, meat consumption, uh, overconsumption. In the past 30 years, the average American has gone from eating 2,000 calories a day to 2,500 calories a day and there's food waste. So if the whole world eats like we do, um, we're in trouble. That's just too much energy and we need to decarbonize that. So what's our opportunity? I'll throw out a crazy idea here. Um, and that is that one opportunity is to provide information to consumers. Label items with energy and carbon footprints. We label things with percent of daily use for sodium, cholesterol, fat, carbohydrates, all those things. We label it in calories, right? But we don't label it in terms of our daily percent of calories. So I propose the following. Take things in the store. For example, start with food. 
label it in energy use based on the percent or the fraction of 2000 calories a day. We'll call that one daily energy unit. We'll look at carbon emissions. We emit about two pounds a day of CO2. So normalize everything to the pounds of CO2 or one, say, daily carbon unit. And the same thing with water, one water unit. And then look at what happens when you go to buy a hamburger or a, a, a um, vegetarian burger like the Impossible Burger. Take a one quarter pound burger. One quarter pound burger, about 240 calories to 300 and plus calories for a quarter pound industrial beef hamburger. So that would be 0.12 D or about 12% of your daily uh, um, energy. And it has a carbon footprint of about 60, about six times what you just exhale per day and about 153 times uh, uh, a gallon of water that you need per day. If you have an impossible burger, that, that has the same calories, but that carbon footprint drops from 6C down to 0.12C. So you can really get a, a sense of how much you can, in, you can save your carbon footprint just by the burger you eat or what you choose to uh, consume at the supermarket or what you consume at Best Buy. Everything ought to be coming with the label, the shirt that you buy, the gasoline that you buy, and so forth. I think information is really critical here. As Wei Pong said, you know, people don't necessarily want to do this, but when confronted with real information, there could be a change. And so that's my two cents for right now. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. And uh, my family just enjoyed some Beyond Burgers for lunch before this panel. So <laughs> right there with you. Um, so Tom, you've been thinking a lot about the role of the agricultural system um, in some of these uh, decision-making spaces, particularly when it comes to the role of agricultural systems and energy systems. So can you speak to your thoughts on challenges and opportunities? Thanks, Erica. Yeah, I'm going to focus on some of the bio-based carbon negative technologies. And I'm going to use technology very widely there because I'm going to include in that photosynthesis, which is a three and a half billion year old biotechnology. Um, I'll come back to that. But, um, but some of those have been mentioned already. And, and Jen Baca noted that biomass energy with carbon capture and storage is widely viewed as the primary near term option for negative emission technologies. However, there are two very different visions of bioenergy systems, one of which has very limited carbon removal and few co-benefits and a number of ethical issues, and, and the other which has substantial carbon removal and major co-benefits and, um, and different ethical issues. And, um, and they're, they're both called bioenergy systems and the, the public's doesn't differentiate between them and, um, and neither do many of our policies. And that lack of distinction and separation, um, I think is, is a significant challenge. Um, first generation biofuels, the corn ethanol that is in every gas station today and many of our, well, all of our, our gas vehicles, <laughs> um, biodiesel from soybeans are both based on annual food crops. And uh, those, um, have lots of negative implications for our agricultural systems. They contribute to the, the carbon challenges that Bruce described. They're very energy intensive to produce and, um, and they don't improve soil and they have water quality concerns. And, um, and, and then some of those first generation bioenergy sources such as palm oil uh, has, has um, contributed to deforestation of tropical rainforests, which have been huge carbon sinks. So there's some serious challenges there. Um, on the other hand, there are other strategies that, that rely on perennial systems and polycultures and can be put in, um, Jen referred to marginal places, um, marginal lands, but some of which are, are actively used and some of which are not. Some of them are used in ways that are, um, could be enhanced uh, by different kinds of management. Uh, Erica and I published a paper this last year that uh, that looked that showed that some of these second generation biofuels from perennial ecosystems, when coupled with carbon capture and storage, can deliver strongly negative carbon energy while enhancing biodiversity, water quality, and soil health. 
So, so there's this confusion between the, this understandable lack of enthusiasm for biofuels because of the first generation challenges that is actually dragging down enthusiasm and investment from government and businesses for the innovation and transformation necessary to get us to those sustainable carbon negative technologies. Just to give you a sense of the scale, every year photosynthesis pulls 10 times more CO2 out of the atmosphere than we put in with fossil fuels. So if we can figure out how to manage that photosynthesis better, it's a huge lever for us to pull to, to draw down CO2 from the atmosphere. In mature natural ecosystems, nearly all of that CO2 returns to the atmosphere every year through decomposition. That's a stable ecosystem by definition, right? Um, and unfortunately with climate change, there have been all kinds of disruptions to natural ecosystems, induced um, greater fire, uh, pests and disease that are actually turning some of these carbon neutral or carbon uh, sinks into carbon sources. So, so we're going the wrong way right now with, with climate change and without management. Um, on the other hand, there's been lots of work done on regenerative agriculture and sustainable forestry to show ways to actually enhance the carbon benefits of some of these systems on the landscape through soil carbon accumulation and ecosystem carbon uh, um, accumulations. Um, and there are ways to manage the harvest of some of that carbon, not all, but some, uh, in ways that can generate productive fuels and also materials for our society. And so we have to sort out how we actually put the, the, the policies and the practices and the management systems in place so that we can manage these agricultural and forest ecosystems so they're, they're carbon benefits are achieved without the negative impacts on the environment and on populations that depend on those. I wanna just close by, by mentioning that uh, those carbon systems that we have, um, and, and that includes the material systems, mass-based timber construction that's now being used for 20-story buildings, um, biomaterials that are long-lived, um, those are job-intensive, blue collar and professional opportunities, most of which are in rural communities. And so if we can get this right, it offers an opportunity for addressing some of the rural challenges in terms of employment and professional opportunity. Um, but if we get it wrong, we will miss out on a huge opportunity for climate mitigation. Thanks, Tom. Great. Um, so um, last but not least, Zhao Jing, um, I'm curious of your perspectives on all of this. You work in the area of advanced um, technologies and sort of energy applications. Where, where do you see the challenges and opportunities? Thank you, Erica, very much. And uh, it's my great pleasure to be here. So I'm going to talk about uh, the carbon, carbon capture and storage technology itself uh, uh, for the to getting uh, negative emissions. We all know that uh, carbon emissions is mainly from uh, fossil fuels combustion. It's, it's the main contributor to the climate change. We also expect that the fossil fuel will keep dominating our um, energy supply for the next uh, several decades to come. So carbon capture and sequestration, also called CCS, which is is already being widely recognized as uh, one practical and viable approach to zero and further negative uh, carbon emissions. In past 22, uh, past 20 years, there's much progress in CCS research and the development. However, we still don't see any like widely uh, deployment of this CCS technology. So I see there's a big challenge associated with carbon capture is, is the scale. Especially when, when this uh, cap, carbon capture technology being applied to the energy use sector. For example, a uh, 1,000 megawatt power plant, it emits about 1,300 tons of CO2 per hour while the current commercial liquid aiming process can capture at 0.2 to 30 tons of CO2 per hour. There is, there is a very huge 
uh, gap there, it means we need to make the size, current size at least 40 times bigger. I think this is a very big engineering challenge. If we use a solid solvent, which has CO2 capacity at 10 weight percent, we, we would need about 13,000 solvent material to run every hour. If, even if we can reduce this cycle time down to one minute, it's very fast. We still need to deal with about 200 tons of solvent materials. So if you imagine that the annual global carbon emission is about 35 million tons and how many tons of materials we will need to, to solve this problem to get zero carbon emissions and what kind of impact to the material market. I, I fully believe this is a combined science, engineering, material and economic challenge. Besides the electricity and industry, there's also about one third CO2 emissions coming from the transportation sector and about 13% coming from homes and businesses. This part of carbon emissions is highly dispersed. We do not see any suitable technology being applied for this uh, portion of carbon emissions. So I see the opportunity there. Luckily, we have uh, and renewable energy grows recent years very fast, such as wind, solar, geo geothermals, which can offer us new opportunity in solve these problems. We can break this big problem into smaller ones, so it's easier to handle. First of all, um, renewable energy could implement the electric supply from fossil fuels so that the size of power plants could be reduced. As a result, the scale of carbon capture for power plants could be downsized. Second, the use of battery or hydrogen powered vehicles for transportation and electrific uh, electrification of home and business, as uh, Jackie mentioned, that it can largely avoid the, the dispersed carbon emissions. The third one is renewable energy also offers uh, opportunity in utilizing those captured CO2. CO2 conversion with renewable energy can pot potentially eliminate the needs of CO2 sequestration, transportation, and even capture step. At the same time, it can produce clean and sustainable fuels, chemicals, and the materials that are currently being produced using uh, fossil carbon resources, including oil, gas, and coal. This de can decrease the consumption of fossil resources, avoid CO2 emissions, minimize uh, environmental impact from those parts of fossil fuels used for production of fuels, chemicals, and materials. In summary, uh, in summary, unfortunately, there's no silver bullet or single technology can solve the problem to achieve the zero and the further negative emission target. I think it requires innovation, collaboration, and integration of various technology to accelerate the CCS progress. And the public outreach and acceptance is also critical. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks, thanks to all of our panelists. I think you each you touched on a lot of topics there. Um, so I would like to encourage the attendees uh, to submit your questions in the Q&A button. Um, I will be receiving them and uh, offer them up to the panelists for a discussion. We have received um, one already. And I also have some questions. I'll, I'll, I'll be a little selfish and, and start with mine, and then we'll, we'll go to the, the Q&As. So one, one thing that I think you all brought up is um, that there is this a scale issue that you know, there are some technologies, there are some strategies, even in the um, sort of social sciences that we, we can build on, but yet doing this at scale to meet the challenge globally seems to be the barrier. 
So my question is, what, what is, who is the audience? Who do we need to be talking to, to kind of get these things moving? And if it is an integrated approach, wh what does that mean from a systems perspective? Um, are, we, are we still too much working in our own lanes and, and not collaborating? And what would it look like if we did collaborate more? And maybe I'll sort of, not to put you on the spot way, but maybe given your, your interest in sort of um, that, that space, maybe you could offer a few thoughts on that, but then I'll open up to anyone on the panel. Yeah, so I'm going to provide a very boring answer, which is there's no silver bullet and we definitely need all of those potential solutions. And I, I think climate change is that type of problem that we need to talk to everyone, but we probably wanna, based on our audience, channel, find the right message so that we can engage them, uh, engage them in a way that would be willing, that they will be willing to be on board. So for example, I think Bruce gave a very good example about how we can talk to the consumers and engage them to uh, start this grassroots movement about changing our consumption behavior. And if we talk about like biofuel, that kind of key technologies, then I think we need to talk to governments and also potential funders so that there will be enough funding into um, supporting this next generation of new innovation that can get us to negative. And I, of course, like policymakers at different levels, at the local level, um, state level, national level, and even put diplo uh, global diplomacy, there are different messages we want to send to them, and there are different things they can get done on the ground. So I, 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 I will try to be brief so that I can hear about the thoughts from the others. Tom, did you have something to say there? Well, I, I mean, I'm, I was looking at some of the other questions that are rolling yeah. in, actually. but. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think integration is critical, as as what you, your suggestion implied, and when we um, emphasize as well, and um, and there are many many kinds of synergies. I mean, I talked about a few of them, but you know, we've got to we've got to think really hard about where we can get the carbon from in an efficient way, and how we can concentrate it, and where we can put it that'll stay there for the long term. And, and there is no discipline or air expertise or, or company or government that actually has all those things figured out right now. So we absolutely have to work together to solve it. Maybe one quick thing I'll add on scale. The, the, the barrier to scale is extremely technology dependent. The example I gave about jet fuels, one of the things that was really, uh, was really the barrier was that in order to certify your cool new fuel, you needed to make way more of it than a startup company could, uh, could actually afford to make. That was too much of a risk. And so it was actually stifling innovation and stifling small businesses from introducing these things. Recognizing that, getting the right people at the table, ASTM, FAA, and a bunch of researchers, including engine companies, allowed them to say, oh, okay, this, this is a problem we can solve. And that, that barrier has actually been lowered significantly in the past decade. And it's, it's a success story because now tons of these new ideas are actually making it to the market, which is fantastic. But this is one example. I think it's going to be really different depending on what the technology is. Great. Thank you. Tom, I'm wondering, there's a question in the chat that you maybe could answer um, about energy efficiency. Um, well, unless there's another one you wanted to answer, <laughs> but, I, but I see one here that came through about um, that, that there wasn't much discussion today about energy efficiency as a strategy for getting to zero or getting to negative. Um, and I know you've been working a lot with Esther Abonio and the, and the building um, group here at, at Penn State, but maybe you could, you could address that question as well. Yeah, and it's a great question. And it is, it is the, um, the underappreciated energy resource in, in America and across the world. So if you look at look back at the efficiency of our economy back in in the 1980s, which for me isn't that long ago, um, it's it's actually extraordinary how much progress we've already made in some sectors. So so right now, if we hadn't had those energy efficient impro efficiency improvements, we would be using about 40 percent more energy than we use today. And, and so that makes energy efficiency our largest single energy resource today. And, and that's true with very little government intervention, um, motivated almost entirely by cost savings and individual decisions. Um, and yet it's doing more to reduce our carbon footprint than anything else. Um, it, it is not ever going to be a negative emission technology. <laughs> But the way to get to negative is to reduce 
the positive emissions and to figure out how to capture CO2 and put it in long lived places and, and create some negative emissions. And the more we can reduce our positive emissions, the easier it is to, to take care of the remaining emissions and go negative. So it's absolutely critical. It is still the cheapest form of energy and it still has huge targets, including in the building sector where most of our energy is used. And so there's, there's really big opportunities for that. Um, I'm, I'm very hopeful that there, I'm, I'm now seeing more interest in, in um, and scaling of some of those opportunities, but there's a lot of work to do. And a lot of inertia in the system, given the amount of current built environment that would have to be retrofitted. Easier to do for new buildings than it is to retrofit existing structures, yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Um, there's another question here related to agrivoltaics and sort of sustainable um, access to land to install uh, agrivoltaics at scale. Um, and I don't know, maybe, I don't know if Jen, you would feel comfortable addressing that question uh, from the ethics perspective. Um, I don't know if you've addressed agrivoltaics in your work directly or not. Yes, thank you. This is something that I've been thinking about quite a bit these days. Um, and actually, we have a graduate student in geography, Zach Goldberg, who I believe will be part of the audience, um, who's going to do his dissertation um, around agrivoltaic rollout um, in Pennsylvania. And, you know, he's actually in the process of going through his qualifying exams for his candidacy. And, you know, I keep urging him to, you know, we visit the biofuel literature and a lot of the thorny ethical questions that came up in the biofuel rollout, um, especially with the first generation biofuels that Tom was talking about, the food versus fuel security challenges. So how do we learn from the past experience of biofuel so that we don't repeat that um, in agrivoltaics? And something that really prompted uh, my interest in the agrivoltaic rollout is that there was a Washington Post article a couple of summers ago that I believe I forwarded to folks like Bruce. Um, and the question in the title of the article was, you know, is solar the new agricultural crop because it's becoming more profitable for farmers in the Midwest to grow solar than to grow crops. So I just thought, well, what is that going to do to, you know, food production and potential food security issues in the US? Um, and then, you know, fast forward a couple years later, Pennsylvania is in the process of joining REGI, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. And part of the energy transition here in Pennsylvania is based on a wide scale rollout and rapid escalation of utility scale solar. And based on what Zach is seeing, there's a lot of talk about situating those solar projects on dairy farms here in Pennsylvania. So that might raise another food security challenge. Um, and you had mentioned the idea of systems perspective in some of your remarks here. It's actually quite interesting, like a difference between biofuels and solar is that, you know, you can talk about situating solar on quote unquote marginal lands a little bit away from food production but you really need to be close to the electric grid if you want to have um, you know, a utility scale project be viable. So you need to be near a substation, near populations, and most likely near better quality agricultural land where, where you know, the farmers are living. So there are some challenges that are yet to be worked out, but I think that, you know, again, if we go back and you know, systematically go through the biofuel literature, you know, we can um, harvest some good lessons learned so that we don't repeat the same mistakes. Bruce, you have your hand up as well. Would you like to respond to that question? Um, yeah, I just wanted to say that the next session, one of the first next sessions is on uh, solar and uh, utility scale solar and this question of agrovoltaic. So I encourage um, people to tune into that. It's a really important issue. Um, the one thing I, I wanted to go back to also is about, um, uh, one of the questions in the chat in the question uh, Q&A was about 2,000 calories a day. Um, you know, I, I can barely, uh, amongst college students, if I ask them how many calories a day should they eat, nobody really knows. I have yet to meet anybody who can tell me how many pounds of CO2 per day that they emit from any activity whatsoever. And so, you know, this idea of education and beginning to develop some literacy about how we live our lives, I think is really key to all this. I, I don't think we can take any step forward until we start to first break open the idea that 
turning off your lights, which are probably LEDs now, isn't going to save your home much energy. But turning down the thermostat is going to do a lot. But neither of those things are going to make any sort of impact on climate change because it's just not enough carbon that you're addressing. And so I think we need to we have an urgency to better educate people and a university can do that. We can all do that. I think we all want to do that. So uh, hopefully uh, forums like this will help do that. Well, you, you raise, an, oh, go ahead, Jen. I was just gonna ask Bruce a follow-up question there. So, you know, in my um, introductory courses, we often have students do a carbon footprint analysis, track their livelihoods for a week, spit out, um, your carbon footprint. Um, you know, are you talking about doing that, like um, bringing it into the labeling sector, um, or you know, or do you have a critique of these carbon footprint calculators? Because I mean, I think that they do put some information out there. They are flawed, of course, but you know, I love seeing the light bulbs go on, if you will, in the students' eyes when they look at you know what is costing them the most carbon when they reflect. Yeah, I, I you know, I think it just starts with. Um, it ought not to be in college, you know, it ought to be in, in middle school and earlier that people should know that, you know, a hundred watt light bulb is the same as 2000 calories a day or something. It's all these units, all these big numbers that get in the way of real understanding. And I think uh, even if you run that carbon footprint, you first have to put it in the perspective of your own, you know, there's nine, you know, seven or eight or nine or 10 billion people we're going to have, they're still exhaling CO2 and every single one of them needs carbon in their food to exhale that CO2. And then there's a magnifier on top of that. And that's really what we need to start with is just just, just address the food system right at the get-go. So I, I could go on, but I'll, I'll cut it there. So, I mean, to a certain degree, you're talking about behavioral change at the level of an individual. And and the IEE report, IEA report did, did address that a little bit. Um, and not just that report, right? This, this tension between, oh, well, if people just did better, it would all be better. But I think Jackie's, Jackie's point is that a lot of this, people, individuals don't have control over it. It's happening at much higher levels of social organization. Um, and there seems to be a tension there. Uh, and well, I want this, I want this panel to talk about opportunities, not tensions. You know, I'm curious about, about that um, trade-off and, and how, how we kind of can move past it. Um, and maybe the answer is all of the above, right? I, I, I get that. Uh, but the education piece, if people don't see a benefit from their behavioral choices, then we're not much further ahead. So how do, how do we get people to see those benefits? And how do we, um, as Michael Mann would say in his book, it, there's both urgency and agency. You know, where's the agency part of, of this? Can I offer something to, I'm sorry, I feel like, uh, I feel that like, echoing what Jackie is saying, that it's useful to also move along the supply chain. We're talking a lot about individual actions here on this panel, but when you look at, you know, what sectors of society are, or, or you know, own most of the greenhouse gas footprint, you know, we need to be also looking at the industrial sector and what can the industrial sector do to improve its operations. So yes, it would be all well and good if, you know, we transition to a more vegetarian diet, which you know, I'm certainly in favor of. That's the argument that I pose in, in my household. But when you look at, you know, the energy intensity of fertilizer and cement manufacturing, you know, um, I haven't run those numbers, but you know, um, would uh, humans transitioning to uh, or individuals transitioning to vegetarian diets, you know, really make a dent compared to, you know, if we came up with better ways, more energy efficient ways to manufacture um, cement and fertilizer. Great. So I don't know if anyone else wants to respond to that. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, um, yeah, I just want to say I have all those numbers, Jen, I'd be happy to share those with you. But consider this one number, 100. That's if you take all the energy we use and divide it by all the people in a certain unit, it's 100. If you look at your personal lifestyle, that number is probably 50 to 60. So you have a tremendous amount of decision-making ability under your control. A large part of that is tied into the food chain, what you decide to eat. And that's why I highlighted it. But a gallon of gasoline, the energy in a gallon of gasoline, is probably the same amount of elect as you use in electricity for your house, your house in a day. 
those are decisions that are in your control. They don't have to be in somebody else's control. I think we need to start and take personal responsibility while we also transform this, this uh, uh, fossil fuel economy to uh, a renewable energy economy. I just want to add. To up. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, I just want to add to that. I think when talking about agency, I think we have a huge opportunity here to make climate change personally relevant, and I think that's why, like, I work a lot on co-benefits because um, taking take just food as an example. When you eat healthier, you also emit less emissions, and when if you have like kids with asthma, then uh, talking about this health co-benefit through improving air quality it has been found to be a very effective way for people uh, to motivate people to do more for climate change. And this goes beyond just the individual level. If you think about what politicians care about in a democracy, when you think about like other type of countries where policymaking needs to be on the ground, this kind of public support always helps to really change the policy agenda and making sure that we have the not only the political will, and also the political feasibility to get it done. So I do think that making climate change personally relevant is really the step zero we should be focusing on right now. Go ahead, Tom. Yeah, and I just wanted, I, I can pull in one of the other questions that was in the chart, which is, you know, what, what is holding us back from change? And, um, and, and I think, you know, part of it is not understanding those co-benefits. So we definitely need to articulate them clearly and communicate them clearly. But part of it is the change will happen when the economies of scale kick in and things become cheaper. And when we also figure out societal ways to make them easier. So better, faster, cheaper, easier, those are things that cause people to change their behaviors. And, um, and, and too often some of the positive climate benefits have been couched in, in language that it's a sacrifice and, and that's not gonna work for individuals, at least not very many. So, so I think we're seeing some transitions right now. I think the EV revolution is a good example of that. If any of you haven't driven an EV car, they're better, faster, more fun and cheaper and um, in the long run anyway. And, and that's gonna drive really rapid change. And we have to think about every other segment of our society and how we get to that point. My son, who's about to get his driver's license tomorrow, just notified me that Lamborghinis are now going to be all hybrid after 2024 or something. So I wanted to make sure I knew that. Um, all right, we, we really are running out of time. There is one important question from Laura Fowler in the chat that maybe um, we could just quickly address, which is sort of these legacy effects. And, and, and the, I guess it's back to you, Jen, but anyone, you know, how do we think about legacy effects of energy production and use and environmental justice concerns? I think both in the material world, but also sort of impacts on communities. Yeah, we had quite the discussion about legacy wells and impacts during the shale network last week. So I feel that I'm sort of, you know, it's a front of mind here. So, I mean, first thing is recognizing, you know, what the past was and not ignoring it. And then, you know, tracing the supply chain and making the folks or, um, the folks who are responsible for those wells or those emissions, um, you know, keeping them on the hook and making sure that, you know, they plug the wells and that, you know, we um, set our bonding rates at the um, at the cost rate that's actually needed to identify and properly plug the, these legacy infrastructures. Thank you. Um, I know there's a lot more we could say on that topic and, and many others, uh, but we are out of time. Hopefully uh, this discussion was enough to whet your appetite in a carbon efficient way um, <laughs> for, for the rest of uh, Energy Days, uh, which I believe begins again at one o'clock. I think there's a break here for a little uh, while and then at one o'clock there will be a solar agrovoltaics or community, uh, solar community discussion among many other good sessions that are running in parallel. So you'll have a choice to make, but we do hope that, that you join and uh, we look forward to further discussions. Thank you very much to my panelists. You were awesome. And thanks to the attendees for questions. I know we didn't get to all of them, but We'll try to keep a record of them um, as well and hopefully address them at a later time. So thanks very much. Appreciate it. Have a good day, everyone.